nice to see everybody here this evening. In uh, installment number two of four of our series on uh, the Magi. And um, if you weren't uh, able to be here on Sunday morning, I'm going to just very quickly catch you up with uh, some of the things we talked about. And um, I, I would say that we're spending four sessions studying the Magi, not because these folks are the most important people in the Bible. And in fact, when you look at how much scripture is devoted to their life, it's an extraordinarily small little bit of passage that's ex uh, devoted to these uh, Magi. But I think they tell us some things uh, anyway. And I think it's worth our while uh, thinking about them because one of the things we want to do is not simply go through this season with the same um, sort of experiences that we always have and the same sort of maybe dulled eyes that we always have. And um, the nice thing about the Magi is the stakes are really low about any sort of questions or conclusions we ask about them. Um, uh, you know, you start asking questions about uh, the baby Jesus and all of a sudden the stakes get a lot higher. Not so with the Magi. And so um, it's the sort of thing that I think we can really sort of dig into and, and ask uh, some interesting questions about. And um, we, we started off last time looking about, well, what does the Matthew account say of who these people are? And then uh, how much have we embellished that account over time? And candidly, we have embellished it tremendously over time, all right? We don't know if there were three of them or 12 of them. We don't know if their names were Balthazar or, or Sam. Uh, we don't know what they came riding on. We don't know where they came from. There's just a world of things that we don't know. And um, so we're, we're really spending uh, last Sunday, tonight, and then next Sunday as well, uh, trying to figure out, well, what are some competing interpretations of who these people were uh, and why they wanted to visit um, uh, the Christ child? And um, um, we really ended last week with this question of, okay, Matthew uses this term, magi, and, and what would his audience have thought about that term? You know, if you close your eyes and, and you sort of think about what we uh, imagine, they were kind, they were generous, benevolent. I, I, I would guess that most of you, if I were to put a picture of St. Nick up next to uh, uh, the Magi, you'd say, oh yeah, well, that's pretty close. Both gift givers, one dresses in clothes from Denmark and the other from Persia, but otherwise, yeah, those, those are basically the same, same figure. I'm not sure that's what Matthew's audience um, would have um, concluded. That's not the reference they would have had to the Magi. So tonight we're gonna to start there and look at two other uh, interpretations about who these Magi may have been. Uh, but before we get started, will you pray with me this evening? So dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for getting us uh, halfway through uh, another work week and we thank you for the extraordinary day today was, both um, the brisk cold as well as the uh, calming and comforting warmth this afternoon. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask your ongoing safety for the members of our families and this congregation and this community and, and this state, this nation, and this world. Keep us all safe and help us find our way to as much uh, normalcy as we can in the days and weeks and months ahead. And Dear Heavenly Father, we ask uh, that anything that we say tonight that doesn't uh, further your message of good news, that um, we just forget that as, as soon as it's spoken, but anything that uh, does resonate with your message, that uh, those are things we continue to reflect on and, and think about. In Christ's most heavenly name, we pray. Amen. Okay, so I, we stopped last time saying that probably Matthew's audience had two references to the Magi when they heard that. And one was both the sort of caste or guild and there is a lot of historical evidence to suggest that people were writing about the Magi as some sort of astrologer in some case, um, some sort of magician in some case, maybe someone who did some fortune telling in some case. So they had a, a skill or a guild or a sort of functional role in society. Uh, but then they were also a sort of a peoples, a sort of ethnicity, if you will. And, um, and uh, you know, as we talked about, they, they started off as probably one of the uh, six tribes that became collated up in, into the uh, Medes. And this was a loose coalition of, of tribal peoples. And probably the role that they played within that loose coalition was as some sort of tribal shamans, uh, practicing all or some set of those skills we, we just described. 
But um, these magi proved themselves to be very wily and ambitious over time. And as um, these loose affiliations of tribes begin to uh, um, constellate themselves and, and develop more sophisticated tools and uh, bureaucratic stru structures and things like that, the ancient empires begin to form. And uh, the Magi don't stay as these uh, simple tribal shamans, but they really insinuate themselves into uh, the depths and the heart of these, um, uh, these ancient empires. And really, um, when the um, uh, Akinamid Empire, which is a Persian empire, uh, begins to form and begins to exercise a lot of uh, uh, power over um, the Middle East and, and even well beyond that, uh, Cyrus the Great becomes the emperor of this empire. And um, he establishes Zoroastrianism as um, the official empire of the, uh, uh, the official religion of the empire. And there are lots of um, uh, similarities between Zoroaster Zoroastrianism and uh, the Jewish religion. And that may be one reason why, and some people have argued it's one reason why that perhaps these magi were more likely to show up uh, at the birth of Christ. But regardless of that, um, when, when we get into the Akinamid Empire, we, we discover that now the magi have made themselves or earned a place as the, um, uh, really the official priest of the um, Akinamid Empire. And, um, and as that empire flourished, uh, so did uh, the Zoroastrian magi. And eventually the Magi become so influential that they really establish themselves as kingmakers of the empire. And I don't know, if, if you've watched The Crown, you've probably seen, um, you know, when the princess uh, uh, becomes the queen, there is a, a sort of ritual element um, that takes place. And, and part of that's in the church and, and the uh, uh, priest and the, and the archbishop has a role to play in making her transform into the queen. So this is partially ceremonial and ritual, um, but it also has some real power. It, it apparent, uh, it's apparent that it's associated with also. A little more than just ritual is the point I'm trying to make. And so um, really no one could claim the throne, uh, we think, uh, without the approval of the Magi during this empire. And besides just controlling this kingly office, uh, there's evidence that they uh, controlled a lot of the judicial office as well. And um, that's really important context to know when you read Esther, and we're gonna talk more about Esther uh, probably on Sunday. When you read Esther 113 and you, and you read, uh, it was customary for the king to consult in matters of law and justice. Uh, he spoke with the wise men, the magi, um, who understood the times. And so now you've got these Zoroastrian magi who are not only serving a priestly function, they're serving very much a political function in terms of their judicial power, and, um, and um, they're, they're performing consultative power as well. Uh, so they have the king's, the emperor's ear. And as so often happens, um, when people have this much power consolidated around them, uh, a fatal flaw rears itself. And that's uh, this notion of hubris. And certainly this is something that happened to the Magi too. I should say that Casey's heard me give this talk before and tonight sort of the history of the Magi and she always says, why don't you speed it through that, <laughs> speed it through that piece a little more. But I love this stuff. This, this is, I think, the really fun stuff. So, um, so we'll spend a little time on this. But, but they commit this crime, this fatal flaw really. It's not a crime of hubris. And you know, hubris, it's, it's, it doesn't translate exactly. It's this notion of, uh, ego, it's this notion of arrogance. And if you look at you know, the world of mythology, heroes fall over and over again because they come to think of themselves as a god. And they commit this hubris. And it always leads to their downfall. And I would say that we see this happening with the Magi as well in this, in this Akedamid Empire. So um, uh, Herodotus, um, is the uh, sort of father of history. He's an ancient Greek uh, historian. He doesn't do history exactly in the way that we do it today, so there are some fantastical elements in his uh, history, but, but roughly speaking, what he's trying to do is create um, a, a history. And, um, and he tells us a story about the Akinamid Empire and the Magi that is also carved into this monument in um, Behistun in Iran today too. You can, you can still go and see this. Now this is carved by Darius. 
And um, Darius uh, is the one who gets to tell history in this case. And so, you know, Herodotus and Darius, they're, they're limited by um, uh, the story that they get from other people. So that, that it may not be entirely the true story. But we know that in about 530 BC, uh, Cyrus the Great dies. And, um, and you know, it, it seems sort of uh, um, ruthless to us today, but uh, when, when the emperor dies, people are gonna try to fill that power vacuum. And, um, and sometimes this happens within the family, sometimes this happens outside of the family, sometimes it's a little bit of both. And in this case, it was really Cambyses II, who is Cyrus's father, who um, says, I'm gonna fill this void and I'm gonna take my father's throne. And uh, again, Seems ruthless to us, but uh, it was way too common in the ancient world. He said, the best way to consolidate my power is to kill any rivals who are gonna uh, try to take this throne. And the biggest rival he had was his brother, Smyrtus. And so he said, I'll solve this problem. That will be set, and he kills Smyrtus. And he really doesn't have any other rivals uh, to the throne that appear at that time. And so he sets off doing the work of an empire. He gets on his horse. And he rides out uh, to you know, make sure um, all the borders of his uh, empire are secure and even expand it. He wants to increase those borders. He's especially interested in sort of eating up parts of uh, Egypt as it exists. And while uh, Cambyses is away, and the story gets a little confusing here, but we believe that a magus, that is a one magi, that a magus named uh, Guamada takes on the image of Smyrtus and tries to uh, seize the throne. So we don't know exactly what that means. My guess is he probably wore Smyrtus's clothes or maybe Smyrtus had a specific signet ring or he walked around with a fancy cane and, and this Magus, he, he just uh, adopted those things for a time away. But he said, with Cambyses Cambus, gone, I'm, I'm the one who should get this throne. And you can imagine that word got to Cambyses very quickly about um, his brother, who he thought was dead, now having taken the throne. And I, I can only imagine what's going through Cambyses' mind at this point. Uh, probably, well, certainly anger, he's mad. Probably fear, he's thinking to himself, did this guy I killed, <laughs> has he now risen from the dead only to take my throne? Um, uh, so about all the emotions you can imagine. Jumps on his horse probably is not paying attention. And uh, the evidence or the stories that we have uh, suggest that um, he got on it too quickly, he had a blade on his side, that blade nicked him on the leg, he um, got gangrene in that leg, and he was dead before he could ever get back um, to um, take his throne back. So a still younger brother of Cambyses, we think, you know, uh, fought with this magus um, for the throne but really another power vacuum has opened up here. And one of the great uh, generals of uh, the Achaemenid Empire was a man named Darius. He becomes known as Darius the Great. And he sweeps in and he kills uh, Guamada and his supporters and he takes the throne. Now there are some people who think that's just the story that Darius tells, but that's not what actually happened. Um, that in fact, there never was a Magus who um, took on the, uh, the form of the younger brother that in fact that actually was the younger brother that Cambyses did not kill. And, um, and so he set up the Magi to take the fall for this. But regardless, uh, Darius says, the Magi had this coup, this sort of uprising. And um, you know, in, the, in a time where you don't have social media and, and you're trying to make sure people get the message and they don't do it again, they use the tools that were available to them. So they cut off the heads of the Magus, they stuck them on poles, and they paraded them around uh, um, the empire telling everybody, here's what these magi did uh, to your ruler. And if, if the stories are true, and again, they may not be, but if the stories are true, people sort of got into a, a bloodthirsty rage as a result of all of this. And they started then killing every magi they could get their hands on in a, in a sort of bloodthirsty slaughter. And we believe the event later becomes commemorated with an annual festival called the Magophonia, or the Killing of the Magi. And um, again, there are some people who think we're confusing holidays and the way those were celebrated, but th there's a lot of people who think that every year um, on this particular day of this festival, the Magi were obligated to uh, remain in seclusion or to risk death if they were caught out in the open. 
And I think this attempted coup um, and, their, and its failure really signals the first decline we see of the Magi's power and influence in the early empires of the Middle East. Uh, after Darius passes away, his son Xerxes becomes the emperor, and he returns some of the Magi's influence uh, to the court. And it appears that the Magi accompany him when he goes to Athens uh, in 480 BC, and he destroys Athens then. Um, Alexander the Great from Macedonia, Greek, he returns the favor about 150 years later, or so the story goes, and uh, it is said that he burned the capital of Persepolis and he destroyed every major, uh, major temple and book and family member that he can identify. Uh, a lot of people argue that he probably thought this was a proportionate response to uh, Persia's burning of the Acropolis, uh, the Acropolis sort of the sacred, the sacred mount there in Greece. And um, you know, as, as a result of all of this, and especially as a result of, of Greece sort of um, dominating this territory during the fourth century BC, we hear very little about the Magi. There's, there's almost nothing written about them. Um, but as Greek power begins to wane, a new empire begins to emerge from the ashes of Persia, this Parthian empire. And we see really one more time where the Magi um, enjoy a resurgence of power. Um, now, Parthians weren't exactly native Persians that were sort of reborn. Uh, all the land in which uh, their territory is based, it's, that's largely where something like the uh, Akitabit Empire would have been also. Um, but they were more tribal immigrants um, who sort of found themselves in, in what's today um, northwestern Iran. And um, uh, these were tribal immigrants who were very optimist, uh, opportunistic. They took a lot of Persia's um, sort of existing culture, and they said, we'll just adopt that as our own. But they also were not uh, ashamed or embarrassed to pull whatever they wanted to from Greek culture either. And, uh, and they formed an empire that was largely Persian, but also had elements of, of uh, a Greek empire to it as well. And we think that the Magi played at least some sort of advisory role in their courts. Now, the Parthians themselves had a terrible time with leadership. And if you thought the Akinamid Empire was bad, the Parthians were like five times as worse. They were killing somebody every day and putting a new leader in place. Um, and that made life at the court very tenuous and very uncertain. And so in the Magi, uh, in, their, in their role at court, um, you know, we think that also was very uh, tenuous as well. And historians of the Parthian Empire, um, they argue that probably by the time of Jesus' birth, the Magi had been so beat up that um, they probably wouldn't have had the uh, influence, they probably wouldn't have had the ability, the power, the motivation to set out on some sort of long journey to pay homage to a new king um, of the Jews. It's also the case, of course, that maybe they were being intentionally provocative because in, in about 50 BC, Rome reestablishes its rule of Judea um, when it installed Herod to rule. Uh, but as you remember, this territory moves back and forth from uh, Roman Empire to Parthian Empire throughout the time leading up to Jesus' birth. And we think that about the time Jesus was born, the Parthians had established some sort of uneasy truce with the Romans. Um, I've read before that the Parthians weren't supposed to cross the Euphrates. So you could get pretty close you know, to J Jerusalem and Bethlehem and those places, but they weren't supposed to get that close to it. But what it suggests to me is that it was at least theoretically possible for these Parth Parthian magi uh, to have made that journey should they have wanted to. But plenty of historians say uh, because of this truth and the, and the nature of this conflict, it's unlikely that they would have done so. And so I think that all of this is sort of historical context that Matthew and his audience might have been familiar with when they saw Matthew use that term magi. And I think it's even more likely that Matthew's audience would have thought about other biblical magi when they read about uh, their visit to the birth of Christ in Matthew's gospel. You know, so the magi, as Matthew refers to them, aren't just historical figures, but they are absolutely um, uh, biblical figures as well. And I think Matthew's audience, of, of all the audiences of the Gospels, would have known their Old Testament. I mean, they're very interested in whether or not prophecy has been fulfilled. And they would have been f familiar with some of these references from what we refer to as the Old Testament. Uh, so I think it's unwise to assume that Matthew wouldn't have known that they would make these associations when he used that term in his account of the Nativity. 
And as far as I can tell, uh, the earliest reference to a Magi figure appears to be in Numbers. And uh, we typically remember this tale about Balaam um, because, well, it's a great story, because his donkey refused to, to proceed. And uh, Balaam is trying to get the donkey to go, and the donkey goes out into the vineyard, and he tries to get him to go, and he's smacking him with his whip or his stick or whatever he had, and the donkey you know, crushes his leg up against the wall, and Balaam cannot get that donkey to go, and he's about to lose his mind when the donkey turns around and he tells him, you know, what have I done to you to make you hit me these three times? And of course, we all forget that Balaam was a major at that point because now there's a talking donkey in the story and that's just incredible. Uh, but, but I would remind you that Balaam had been hired by King Balak of Moab to actually place a curse on the Hebrew people. And instead of doing so, he offers three blessings uh, to them, especially after he sees that it's the angel of the Lord that's blocking the donkey's way. It's not just a stubborn donkey right here. And so Balaam offers these three blessings instead of these three curses. And I can just imagine King Balak saying, what in the world? We had it all set up. This was going to work perfectly. And what are you doing? But very interestingly, Balaam says in Numbers 24, 17, he says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. And this is, I think, well, sort of a very telling prophecy, but it's also the first of several occurrences of the Magi in the Bible. And although Balaam ends up doing a good thing, you know, he's really a sort of dangerous figure if we think about it. And things could have gone very wrong if the angel of the Lord had not intervened at that moment. Now we encounter a whole mess of Magi in the stories of Daniel and Esther. I'm going to talk about those on Sunday uh, when we pick up the story, but, but let me remind you there too. Um, you know, Daniel himself becomes a sort of leader of the Magi, but there are um, uh, pits of fire, there are lions that are trying to eat people, all of this sort of stuff. Once again, sort of dangerous figures that they present themselves as. And in the New Testament, we read uh, about at least two more Magi, as far as I can tell. And may, Matthew's audience may not have known these stories, but I think that um, they give us some idea about the way his audience may have thought about Magi generally. And so the first appears to be in Acts 8, when Philip encounters Simon the sorcerer. And Simon had been bewitching the people of Samaria, and we don't know exactly what that means. Um, you know, I mentioned to you last uh, on Sunday that there is this huge genre of uh, legends associated with the birth of Christ. And quite honestly, there's another whole genre of literature about Simon the sorcerer and all the sorts of powers that he had. And he, in some cases, say, oh, he could fly. He was like a Superman figure almost. So we don't know exactly what he was doing, but People respected him in Samaria. They, they thought he had some power associated with him. Until Philip shows up on the scene. And man, Philip must have been a fantastic uh, preacher because um, uh, you know people are converting. Uh, they're wanting to be in Philip's presence. Uh, Simon himself um, is impressed by uh, the preaching that Philip does. And, and then also there are all these signs and miracles that begin to surround Philip as well. And Simon the Sorcerer, uh, clearly into power, he wants to get in uh, on some of that. And so um, Simon, in this amazing moment, he says, uh, will you baptize me and can I follow you? And, and Philip agrees to do so. Now, uh, you'll remember last time I told you I'm a, I'm a cultural analyst, not a, a theologian. And so this is one of those theolo theological pieces I don't fully understand. But remember that Philip baptizes them but Peter and John need to come out in order to give them the Holy Spirit. And they have to lay hands on everybody who's been baptized to give them the Holy Spirit. So Peter and John come out, and they're, I don't know what's happening here exactly, but it is something impressive, clearly. And they're doing this work, and Simon the Sorcerer sees it, and he says, now that's so impressive, that's real sort of magical power i got to get my hands on. And he, so he says, you know, I'll buy this from you. i got plenty of money. Tell me how much it costs to give me this power. And um, that didn't set very well with Peter, as you can imagine. So, um, so he tries to purchase the ability. Peter uh, curses him. And, you know, Peter tells him, repent. 
And what we'd probably like to see at the end of this story is um, the Magi saying, ah, I'm so sorry. Okay, I repent. Let me you know, sort of lift me up here. But what he says is, pray to the Lord that none of these things which you've spoken about come to me. And that's kind of the last we see of him. So from my perspective, he's never really redeemed in this story. Later in Acts 13, we encounter um, Elimus, or also known as Bar-Jesus. And he's another magus who opposes Paul before the Roman uh, proconsul Sergius Paulus. And the Roman proconsul has invited Paul uh, to come and, and tell him about uh, Christ. And um, uh, the proconsul is very impressed by this and, and he's moved by this, but Bar Jesus or um, uh, Elimus, he's in the proconsul's um, court and he's got his ear. And he's, in some way, we don't know exactly what, he's undermining everything that Paul says. And uh, you know, you know, Paul sort of does like uh, Peter did with, um, with Simon the sorcerer, and he's furious with him. And he calls on the Holy Spirit, and you know, he tells him, um, uh, you will be struck blind. And once again, um, what he says happens, happens, and this Magi is struck blind. And again, we don't know what happens at the end of this story. Um, uh, Paul goes on, continues his travels, and you know we, we don't have this this uh, major saying, "I'm sorry, now I get it, now I understand, I've, I've, I've converted, or, or whatever would happen next." So in all of this, I think we see that Matthew's magi reference are in some ways entirely dissimilar from the story we tell about the wise men or the three kings in contemporary Christmas celebrations. We've already talked about you know, what you may see when you close your eyes, these kind, benevolent, generous men, maybe look a little like Santa Claus, but, but I don't think that appears to be the reference that Matthew's audience would have had for these three kings. We're gonna come back to that on Sunday, but for right now, I wanna give you at least two other versions of who these magi were. So let's turn our attention away from Matthew's account for a moment. Look at uh, a guy named uh, 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 Dwight Longenecker. And in 2017, he wrote a book called Mystery of the Magi, subtitled The Quest to Identify the Three Wise Men. And Longenecker actually grew up in an evangelical uh, household. He was an ordained priest in the Episcopal Church and then became an ordained priest in the Catholic Church. And he wrote this book, he said, in order to peel away the fabrications and legends from the Magi's visit that had accumulated over the years. And, um, and these things just absolutely drove him crazy. And, and I mean, some are so outlandish as to drive you crazy. So one of the um, uh, ones that he references in this book that he really dislikes is uh, a legend told by Aphrodisus. And this was an infancy legend from Syria. And the legend is that when um, um, Christ was uh, born, that a pagan temple comes to life. So all the statues and the sculptures in it, they all magically come to life. And the wise men of the court take this to mean that a king has been born in Judea and the king of Persia sends uh, the Christ child gifts uh, by way of the uh, Magi's visit. And Longenecker looks at several of these um, versions and he, he wants to debunk all of them. And I think he feels so strongly about this debunking because he wants to really situate the story of the Magi within historical realities. That's important to him. Let's go ahead and advance that once more, uh, Gary. Uh, and, and he argues this. He says, if the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is true, then these are the most earth-shattering events of all time. And he argues that if the gospel is historical, then it is true. And if it's true, then we must confront the reality of Jesus Christ. I think Longenecker's logic, it's sound enough, but an inverse conclusion, I don't think can be drawn from his conclusion. And he tries to do it in this, in this book. So he seems to suggest that if every element of it, in it is not historically true, then we cannot confront the reality of Jesus Christ. And, and I understand how his argument works. It's a little like this, say, well, if the, you know, if the visit by the Magi wasn't true, well, then maybe Nita was the story of, you know, um, 
Mary's uh, encounter with uh, the angel of the Lord, maybe their travel to Bethlehem, and ultimately you work yourself into saying, uh, Jesus wasn't really born. That's just a really interesting story that you know may make a, a moral point. I don't think that's how that argument necessarily has to lead to. It could lead to that, but I don't think it has to. And I don't think it has to because I think you know we we add narrative elements to very important stories all the time in human experience. That happened last Sunday at church when Ricky was preaching. Uh, Ricky told us a preacher's tale about a text his brother-in-law sent him just before the election. You'll, you'll remember that. Now, he ultimately told us at the end of that tale, oh, my brother-in-law didn't actually send that text, right? But the story was funny. Oh, well, first of all, nobody stormed out when they said, what? That story wasn't true? Well, I'm, I'm believing then. And most of us laughed when we heard it because it was true, um, whether or not it was historically accurate or not. So. I, I love and I really appreciate what Longenecker is trying to accomplish in this book. But I will tell you that as someone who's been trained as a folklorist, I think he gives too much historical or significance to historical reality and not enough credence to the reality of storytelling, which is a reality that may or may not be situated in this time, but which still speaks to a deep truth. And I think we know that um, in, in our deepest uh, being. But nonetheless, let's, let's look at Longenecker's argument for a second. So he argues that those who say that Matthew's account of the nativity is a construction, that is, it's just stuff he made up, in order to try and verify um, and confirm the prophecies of the Old Testament, that they aren't paying attention either to historical facts or to what Matthew was actually saying in that account. And based on the ground we've already covered, we. I think we can confirm that a lot of people don't pay attention to what Matthew is actually saying in that account. But Longenecker goes back to um, you know, this, this uh, chapter of Isaiah, Isaiah 60, which we've already talked a lot about. Um, and he's, you know, he says, pay attention to what that says. The wealth of nations shall come to you. Caravans of camels shall cover you. Dromedaries of Midian and Ephah, all from Sheba, shall come bearing gold and frankincense and heralding the praises of the Lord. And Longenecker argues that if Matthew really wanted to invent a story just to fulfill prophecy, why didn't he add the details about the camels? Now, a lot of times when we think about the Magi, we see them showing up on camels, but that's not what Matthew talks about. That's what Isaiah talks about. So Longenecker says, look, if Matthew was really just trying to make a point with this story, they would have shown up on camels and Matthew would have told us that. And he also would have omitted any reference to myrrh because myrrh didn't show up in that passage from Isaiah. Um, so, you know, he argues this is one piece of the argument that makes a compelling case to suggest that uh, Matthew's intention was not just to make a point. He was really trying to document historical fact. And one of the keys, I think, to Longenecker's argument is uh, the dating of the Gospel of Matthew. And I did not know this in start, until I started studying uh, the Magi, but um, the dating of the Gospel of Matthew is a very contentious topic among many religious scholars. And Longenecker really sides with the group who believes that Matthew is at least as old as, if not older than, Mark. And it's probably, he argues, the, um, one of the earliest records of the life of Jesus and would have come from people who had firsthand knowledge of Jesus. And so uh, some of you have played the little game whispering down the lane where you know somebody whispers something to the next one and, and by the time you tell the story five or six times, it could be an entirely different story. And, um, and Longenecker's position is this story is being told by people who were there, who were saw it, who knew what was going on. Now, Longenecker, as he, as he creates this argument, he, he further makes the case that um, historical and cultural conditions probably do make it unlikely that Persian Magi could have been the actual visitors to Christ's birth. We just talked about what those historical and cultural conditions were that would have kept them from showing up there. So instead he asks, you know, could there have been some other Magi that Matthew was referencing? And in doing so, he really turns his attention to the Nabataean Magi. And at the time of Jesus' birth, Petra, in what's today uh, southern Jordan, um, it was really the thriving center of the Nabataean kingdom, which was a major power in the Middle Eastern world at, at this time. Now, most of us don't know a lot about uh, Nabataean culture, and that's because they didn't leave a, a written record. 
And so everything we know about the Nabataeans are from their artifacts that they've left and their architecture and what other people wrote about them. But we know that um, they were renowned for their hydraulic inventiveness and they could control and conserve and utilize water as well as anyone, which really gave them um, a significant amount of authority um, uh, in this uh, very important but difficult uh, trading uh, route in uh, the world. Um, and about in the 6th century BC and, and seemingly overnight, they go from nomadic pastoralists to controlling most of the trade across the Middle East. Uh, Longenecker argues that the Nabataeans are an Abrahamic group. They descended from Ishmael, and their lands almost certainly served as a location in, in northern Arabia to which many Jews fled after the destruction of Jerusalem. And, you know, we talk about the um, Jewish diaspora, and, of course, what that means is when conquerors come in, um, uh, some people are killed, a whole lot of people are, are removed from their homes and, and taken someplace else and, and resettled. And, and then some just disappear. I mean, they, they leave in the middle of the night and we don't know where they go. Uh, and, and so Longenecker's arguing there were probably a whole lot of Jews who ran to Northern Arabia at this time. And so he argues that um, if that's the case, then there probably would have been some very deep historical, cultural, and religious connections between the Jews and the Nabataeans. And he also notes that uh, the Babylonian king Nabodonidus, he came to Northern Arabia after the invasion of Jerusalem to really establish a new capital in this area. And uh, based on some speculative interpretations of some carvings like the one you see here, that's not a lot to go off of, but um, that's sometimes all you have. Uh, but based on some interpretations of carving, uh, Longenecker argues that Nabataeans would have had Persian-like magi in their midst who would have been very interested in any new king of the Jews because of this shared history and culture, um, assuming uh, some of the Jews fled to northern Arabia. Um, and that shouldn't surprise us. We know that the Magi insinuate themselves into a variety of empires. And it may also be the case that when Darius suppressed the uh, Magian uprising, that a lot of those Magi's would have fled as well to Nabataean lands um, and, and you know, created this connection with the Jewish people that were there. And uh, Longenecker goes even so far to posit that it may be that the school of Isaiah, um, which some people think um, the authors of the chapters uh, that begin with uh, chapter 41 of Isaiah, that that school of wise men were located in Nabataean lands. And uh, you know, the 60th chapter of Isaiah, which we've already been talking about, it contains really some of the most famous prophecy of, of all the wise men. And uh, perhaps it's specifically referencing Nabataean Jews who would lead all the world to the Jewish Messiah. And I'll just read part of Isaiah 60 to you here. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look about you. All assemble and come to you. Your sons come from afar, and your daughters are carried on the hip. Then you will look and be radiant. Your heart will throb and swell with joy. The wealth of the seas will be brought to you. To you the riches of the nations will come. Herds of camels will cover your land, young camels of Midian and Ephah, and all from Sheba will come bearing gold and incense and proclaiming the praise of the Lord. Now Longenecker further notes that Herod is central really to his argument that these Magi were Nabataean and not Persian. Um, you know, remember that the Middle East in the first century BC, it, it's all frequent political advances and retreats by a number of competing forces. Romans were in there, Parthians, uh, Nabataeans, lots of others vying for power also. And the Nabataeans were pretty shrewd political maneuverers, and uh, we believe that they established an uh, early alliance with Antipater, uh, Herod's father, and the power behind the Hasmonean court, um, which was the Jewish dynasty under the Greeks, and which for a time um, was its own dynasty, um, absent the Greeks. And Antipater was married to a Nabataean princess named Cyprus, who gave birth to five children one of which was Herod. 
And uh, when two Hasmonean rivals to the throne were feuding, Antipater sent Cyprus and the children home to Petra in Nabataean lands for safety. And so the young Herod, um, he was not only the son of a Nabataean princess, but he was brought up at the court of the Nabataean royal family. And the subsequent political machinations between Herod and the Nabataeans, uh, they're many, they're complicated. Uh, we don't have time to discuss them all here. I'd encourage you to go read Longenecker's book if you're interested in that, and it really is very interesting. Um, but suffice it to say that at the time of Jesus' birth, there appears to be an alliance, uh, and a strong alliance, really, between Herod and the Nabataean ruler. And so Longenecker assumes that this would make it perfectly reasonable for a Nabataean Magi contingent to visit Herod. Um, they, they had the proximity, they had the wherewithal, they didn't have some of the um, uh, uh, political uh, restrictions that the Parthian Magi would have had. And, and they could have done it since their gifts could easily be interpreted as a diplomatic gesture, an, an offering or a gift even, if you would, uh, because they weren't uh, using gifts that were, um, or, or objects that were really intended to trade, but were products of the Nabataean landscape itself. And finally, um, Longenecker argues there's a tradition among early church fathers, um, um, uh, Epiphanius, Tertullian, Justin Martyr, that uh, bring the Magi from Arabia and not from Persia. And if Matthew was writing to the people in Judea specifically, then Arabia would be to the east and it wouldn't be um, the Parthian or the Persian Empire. Uh, Arabia would be to the east, and it would be right in alignment with uh, Nabataean lands, as this, as this map illustrates. And again, I, I appreciate Longenecker's conviction that everything in Matthew's account must be factual, so there can be no dismissal of the reality of who Jesus uh, was. Uh, but I'm not positive that, in the case of the Magi, an all-or-nothing approach um, is the most sensible way to proceed. So let me turn now to an entirely different version of the Magi story. And this one uh, doesn't pretend to be historical truth. It's uh, widely accepted as a literary construction. It was meant to be a narrative fiction. And all it really tries to do is make meaning of the account of Matthew. It does not try to provide a historical record of the Matthew account. And in 2010, um, uh, a guy named Dr. Brant Landau, who's now a, a senior lecturer at the University of Texas, he published his dissertation, which was really just a translation of a, I say just, a, it was a translation of a Syrian manuscript entitled The Revelation of the Magi. And it was subtitled The Lost Tale of the Wise Men's Journey to Bethlehem. And you know, Landau, uh, he, he uh, remembers that this manuscript is one of those rare finds you hope you, hope you get your entire uh, scholarly life. And he found it as a graduate student. Um, he had already read an oblique reference uh, about it in an article but no one had done anything with it, like actually translate it. Um, partially this was because it was written in Syriac, but he had just finished um, taking his first year of Syriac when he got the opportunity to go to the Vatican and look at their manuscript and spend enough time with it so that he could translate it. When, we're not exactly sure when it was written, but we know it had to have been written as early as the fifth century, maybe as early as the second century, um, and we have a, a, a reference to it in a medieval compendium of Christian legends known as uh, the Golden Legend that's uh, very well known throughout medieval Europe. And thanks to its inclusion in this com uh, compendium, knowledge of the manuscript was, will, was really quite right, widespread, even though nobody had gone back to look at it um, in the original. Uh, Thomas Aquinas refers to it, and a lot of illuminated manuscripts um, make reference to this uh, uh, document, a lot of illuminated manuscripts from the Middle Ages. And although it's written from the first person perspective of the Magi, um, Landau has no illusions about it being anything but fiction. And he argues that the story's intention is really to make a very specific point, and that uh, point, it's not to support the historical record. The point is to illustrate that Christ is the absolute savior of all. And here's the way the story develops. The Magi in this manuscript are members of an ancient mystical order, and they reside in a land called Shear. We don't know where that land is necessarily, except it's described as in the extreme east of the world at the shore of the great ocean. 
And this uh, manuscript argues that the Magi are called Magi because they pray in silence. So it really references uh, a, a skill, a habit that's very different from what we find uh, elsewhere. Um, the manuscript argues these are descendants of Seth, uh, the third son of Adam and Eve. And Seth was believed to have been a very pious person. He gave his heirs a, a prophecy of supreme importance. And the prophecy was this, a star of indescribable brightness will someday appear, heralding the birth of God in human form. Seth had learned about this prophecy from his father, Adam. And uh, Adam learned it because the star in this manuscript says it originally had hovered over the tree of life, illuminating all of Eden and before Adam's sin caused the star to vanish altogether. And so every month, for every year, for thousands of years, this order of the Magi would carry out its ancient rituals and expectation of the star's arrival. And they would ascend their country's most sacred mountain, the Mountain of Victories, and pray in silence at the mouth of the Cave of Treasures of Hidden Mysteries, where Seth's, Seth's own prophetic books are housed and read by the Magi. And just as a very quick side note, I'll share with you that the Cave of Treasures actually makes an appearance in, in a lot of other Syriac uh, legendary texts too. In some of these, God condemns uh, Adam and Eve to live in the cave where the mystical gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh are enshrined, and the Magi have to travel there to the Cave of Treasures to actually get those gifts from them before they can go see the Christ child. Now that's not part of the revelation of the manuscript, but this cave tends to show up a lot in some of these um, legendary materials. Back to Landau's story. Uh, when one of the Magi dies, his son or his close relative takes his place, continuing to perform the same ritual. Um, and then during one visit to the mountain, incredibly, the foretold star appears. But the star can be seen by no one but the Magi. And ultimately, the star reveals itself to be not a star at all, but a small, luminous human. And if you can barely make that out in the picture up there, you'll see that that star is actually a small, luminous human. And this star child reveals to the Magi that he's the son of God, but he never calls himself by the familiar names of Jesus or Christ. And the star child instructs the Magi to follow it to Jerusalem so that they can witness its birth and participate in the salvation God has planned for the entire world. The Magi discuss what they have seen, and they realize that each of them saw the star child in a different form. You heard echoes of that on Sunday when we talked about uh, some of the traditions of what happened when the Magi went in to visit the baby Jesus. So they prepare a, prepare a caravan, um, and the star magically removes all obstacles. This mountain's in the way, the mountain gets shrunk down. What, uh, uh, lake's in the way, the lake dries up. You know, in, in, any problem that they would have. And it makes what should have been a journey of months something they accomplish in, in about three days. Um, and they arrive in Jerusalem, and once they arrive in Jerusalem, this account of what happens with Herod, it matches uh, almost exactly with uh, Matthew's chapter 2 text. And then again, the star leads them to a cave in Bethlehem where it transforms into a talking infant whose birth is accompanied by unseen singing angels. And the child tells the Magi their ancient mystery has been fulfilled and commissions them to become witnesses to him and his gospel for the people of their homeland. They are able to travel home as quickly as they got there. Once again, all the obstacles are out of their way. They're surrounded by friends and family. And uh, the Magi reveal that the star child is still with them since he is in fact present throughout the entire world. And strangely enough, when people eat of the Magi's food, ah, then they can see the star child too. And everybody says, wow, look at that star child. Um, now, Landau doesn't believe that the last section in this manuscript was actually original to the revelation of the Magi. He thinks it's a later edition, but it ends with a visit by the apostle Thomas to the Magi on one of his mission journeys. And the Magi meet with him and they tell him of their experiences and they ask him to baptize them. The text ends with the Magi preaching and performing miracles throughout Sheer. And, and Landau argues that this creative and literary account of the Magi reveals its meaning and importance really by what it does not say. And in particular, its careful avoidance of the name Jesus Christ. And the story raises the possibility that um, uh, Christ has appeared to many people and yet not revealed to them not revealed himself perhaps as Jesus Christ. So the fundamental Christian message this text argue is not simply that Christ has been sent in order to save all of humanity. That would probably have been a common enough belief among some Christians that its presence in this text would be unremarkable. 
The revelation of the Magi seems to go much farther than this, claiming that the revelation of Christ is actually the foundation of all humanity's religious beliefs and practices. And what the Magi have experienced is the fulfillment of their age-old prophecy, and while obviously of great significance for them, is but one drop of salvation from the House of Majesty, one limited instance of Christ's salvific activity in the world. So we have a biblical account of the Magi in Matthew 2, onto which several thousand years of literary or legendary embellishments have been added that shape our contemporary understanding of, of who these Magi were, or maybe it's better to say um, our contemporary understanding of who these Magi were shapes how we read the Matthew 2 passage. We have a historical reading of the story that attempts very much to make it factual, and we have an unapologetically contrived but radic radically significant story of who these Magi were and what happened to them. But these are not the entirety of the accounts that exist about the Magi, and I'm not going to really go on at length here, but just to give you one other example. Some argue the Magi were really Hebrew rabbis living in Parthian lands as a result of the Jewish diaspora. Being Hebrew rabbis, they would have longed to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem any, any chance they get, especially for a high holy day. And um, in fact, we know that a great many uh, Hebrew pilgrims from outside of Israel often came to Jerusalem for one of the three annual high Sabbaths. And if these were the Magi, one argument goes, the, the wise men of Matthew's account, then they may have arrived in Jerusalem at the same time as the beginning of the seven-day long Feast of Tabernacles, or the first night and day of which is the annual high Sabbath. It's in early fall, uh, in around early October. And if this was the case, then perhaps Jesus was not born in a barn or a stable or a grotto or a cave, but rather in a temporary dwelling called a tabernacle, a sukkah or a booth, which had been built in the tens of thousands throughout the region of surrounding Jerusalem during this festival, uh, this Feast of Tabernacles celebration. And then he would have been placed in a manger or a food crib because of the elements of the festival. And among other things, this might have illustrated and demonstrated that he is the bread of life from heaven. But, you know, you read an account like that and you wonder, well, if, if that's really the case, why didn't, Matthew, why, why didn't Matthew just tell us that these magi were actually rabbis? Why would he insist on referring to the people in his account as magi with all the attendant biblical references that are attached to this label? So we covered a lot of ground tonight, and I'm going to stop here tonight. But on Sunday, we're going to offer one more account of who these magi were. And this really comes, uh, it, it's my own version, my own interpretation, and it comes from um, sort of a reading of, of all of these different things and certainly some of the historical and cultural and biblical uh, reference we can see about the Magi um, that Matthew, I think, was probably referring to. So I hope you come back to class on Sunday and hear the rest of the story, and then we will finish up this series um, a week from tonight, and we'll look at Okay, well, they went home by another way, but what in the world happened to them then? And why in the world do they keep showing up in culture and society uh, around the world? And we'll, we'll cover all of that as well as trying to ask, why do they stick with us so much? Why can we not let them go? Uh, we'll, we'll do that before the end of this. But let me uh, offer a final prayer before we break tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to always come back to uh, the depths of your scripture and... Um, and to reflect and think on um, uh, the, the extraordinary epic tale you tell us of, of how you've redeemed your people. And dear Heavenly Father, we, we pray that we never find that a dull story and we always find ways to get enthusiastic and excited and to find meaning in that story. And we know that this was timely for the people who heard it and we believe that it is timely for the, us as we hear it today too. And we ask for that message to be as clear as possible to us. Thank you for this opportunity to gather with friends this evening. And we look forward to being together again soon. It's in your most holy name that we pray. Amen. Amen. And I think we are dismissed. Is that correct? Thank you very much.